obviously interested in dynamics uh, in a broad range of application areas. Um, and what we've been mostly thinking about doing now is really just bringing machine learning ideas over to dynamical systems. To think about taking recordings of systems and try to infer what the governing equations are. Second is to think about these nonlinear dynamics and maybe thinking about just embedding it in a better set of variables. How would you do that? And third, uh, there's a real practical thing here, which is if you have these systems, how do you measure them? We do not have the luxury in many of our systems of full state measurements. So you're going to have to deal with that reality, and there's a lot of uh, techniques to, to handle that. Uh, now, the embarrassing point is that I thought I knew AX equals B until about five years ago when I was starting to be humbled consistently with my lack of knowledge around AX equal to B. Um, and in particular, what I started to realize is when you start to think about a lot of these problems, especially in data, your AX equal to B are not square matrices. They're things that look like this. You're either massively overdetermined or massively underdetermined. <laughs> And so when you start handling systems like this, you've got some choices to make about how to solve these. In particular, if you're over or under, you either have an infinite number of solutions or no solutions at all. So right away, you're going to have to make some choices about what you're going to do to solve that. And by the way, just in, you know, normally I didn't have to think about it because I just hit backslash in MATLAB and I had my solution. I didn't have to think twice about being over or under. It just gave me something. And then I started thinking about, well, what is it actually giving me? And maybe I can improve that. And even there, you have a few MATLAB commands. There's six of them right there off the, off the shelf that you can do that solve AX equal to B in these cases. And so the question is, how do you use some of these different methods for AX equal to B to your advantage? Um, and so it really gets down to this. It's not AX equal to B. And over and under, you're going to have to impose a constraint. Okay? So a lot of the initial parts of my talk will just be on, on that and telling you about that constraint. And in particular, the constraint I'm going to talk about is uh, promoting sparsity. Okay? Uh, more broadly, if you're thinking about machine learning, I would say this is like, this is my, if I had to summarize machine learning in like as simply as possible, I'd say there it is. So you're not necessarily solving a linear system, you're solving some nonlinear system of equations subject to something. And in fact, that's all a deep neural net does right there in, in some abstraction. Okay. So let me tell you about what we were doing with AX equal to B. And here are the ideas to do model discovery. I want to highlight my two collaborators in this first piece of work. Steve Brunton is uh, my main collaborator. Everything I'm talking about, he's uh, collaborating with me. We have a large group of students and postdocs that we work together with. Josh Proctor was involved in this first work here. He's at the Institute for Disease Modeling uh, out in Seattle. We have a lot of billionaire scientists in Seattle. I mean, the fund institutes, this is one of them. Um, so here's, the, here's sort of what we normally think about. Um, I have this dynamical system here. And the dxdt equals some n. x can be high dimensional. And it can have some parametric dependency mu, okay? And I have some measurements of that system. So normally the way I was sort of brought up, raised in my educational background, I would write down that equation first, right? You write something down, whether it be Navier-Stokes or Maxwell's equations or something like this. We have all kinds of textbooks to tell us what that n is for different uh, specific science areas. And then, of course, we have some measurements. And so normally you would write down a model. You would develop it, write some code for it, do some simulations. Maybe you have some parameters you don't know. And then you would say, well, it has to be somewhat consistent with the experimental measurements I have. Okay? And now we're entering, I think, an age where what we do have is instead is a lot of measurement. And maybe I don't even know what N is. Okay, so now the, the situation uh, is a bit reversed. What we're trying to try to do is say, I can take, I can give you terabytes a day of measurements. Okay. Now, now, of course, you've got to decide what you want to do with that terabyte per day that you're collecting. Uh, and you have to see if that's useful information. And you better process it pretty fast because all of a sudden you find yourself six months later 
with 180 terabytes, and now you need a specialty team just to be able to extract the data out of some database. Okay. Uh, there's many situations where, especially, maybe you know microscale physics. It seems to exhibit large-scale dynamics, and it's very difficult to write down principled approaches to writing down that equation. Biology is a perfect example. We don't have F equals MA type models in neuroscience. We might know what an individual neuron does, but when we look at whole brain activity with billions of neurons, we really don't know what we're doing there. So the question we ask is, what could the right-hand side be? So what we want to do is say, well, let's posit a bunch of things that we've seen for a lot of models across the engineering, physics, and biological sciences. We're going to build a library of potential right-hand sides. And it really is limited by your imagination. And this library still is constructed by, in some sense, you being the expert, which is, it could depend upon constants, linear terms, quadratic terms, cubic, so forth, sines, cosines. You, you, know, you can put anything in there you want. And what you see here is what I've got is these different po possibilities. And so for instance, the quadratic term for an n-dimensional state space vector, here's all the possible quadratics. And so each row of this is a different time snapshot. So I collect the data, the state space, and I can build any one of these columns of my library. This is my matrix A in my AX equal to B. And so this matrix, typically, I'm going to record for a long time. And so this is going to be a tall, skinny matrix. I might have hundreds or thousands of library elements, but I might have millions of measurements in time. All right. So let me show you what we want to do with this. I have a library of potential functions. And by the way, when I collect a state space x, I can also differentiate it to get x dot. Remember, I'm trying to construct x dot is equal to some right-hand side. So I can construct x dot. So I have the B matrix, the B vector, and the A matrix. All I got left is to get X. So I'm going to show you an example of this. Let's go ahead and take Lorenz. Here it is. It's a very simple system. And I'm going to say that I have measurements now. I can generate this. So what I'm going to do is going to simulate this. I'm going to generate time series of X, Y, and Z. And now I'm going to blindfold myself in some way which is all I give you is the time series. And the question is, could you back out the model that produced the time series? Okay, So I have x, y, and z in time. I can differentiate it to produce x dot, y dot, z dot. And then what I say is, OK, here's I can produce this. Here's my matrix of library elements. And remember, I have what we did here is all the way up to fifth order polynomials. And so you can fill all these in. So I have a, x equals to b. I now have a giant, tall, skinny matrix. I've got to solve AX equal to B. And if you were to hit backslash at this point, you'd get something uh, erroneous. What you would find is if you do AX equal to B, and if you do the backslash or if you do the pseudo inverse, at least square type regression, it would tell you that it would try to load all these coefficients up. It'd say, like, every term is, is important. Okay, So least square fitting in this scenario is the worst thing you could potentially do. What you believe and know is that in most physical systems, the dominant balance of physical activity is a few terms. So I'm going to solve AX equal to B subject to, I want an X that is sparse. Now you could do a lasso trick here. This is why lasso was invented. What we do is a sequential least square thresholding. The nice thing about least square fitting is you have very fast algorithms. So you can just do a least square fit, throw away all the small terms, do it again, do it again, and do it again. The non-zero terms that are left over are indicated here by these dots. It corresponds to the, the exact terms in the Lorentz equation. So you give me the time series of the Lorentz equation, I actually back it out for you from my library. And in fact, this was a 28. It came out to be 27.99. So it's, it's amazingly close to also to picking up the correct par parameter dependence. So here what we do is we can select the data. You can see it here. We have some noisy uh, sketches of, of this thing. We've added noise to this. It still does a really nice job recovering. 
The key to this is our differentiation is we took total, total variational derivatives. That helps produce a much more accurate derivative than if you do. Finite differences is going to destroy you if you try to use them here. They're just not good enough, especially if you have a little bit of noise. So if you have a good differentiation technique, you want your best algorithm out for you to use here. OK. Let's take a harder example, because this one maybe was too simple. Let's try to think about flow around the cylinder, classic problem in applied mathematics. I have, I have, a, I have a cylinder here, some fluid coming by, and you get this vortex shedding. And Here's what I'm going to do. This is a pretty high dimensional problem. So the discretization of this in space, so you have lots of x and y positions. So e even under moderate discretization, you might have hundreds of thousands, millions of, of, of your state space. State space is very big. But what we know is there's low rank structure here. And you take snapshots and you do your POD reduction, you find three modes dominate the dynamics. So what you're going to do is say the following. So here's what's interesting, by the way, about POD and SVD in general when we do these reductions. You, you take your data matrix, you get, three of, you get three matrices back, U, S, and V. U has these modes that you like. The sigma matrix tells you which, how important they are. And then we typically throw V in the trash. V is the time dynamics associated with those modes. And then we just project onto these modes and build a model. But here what I'm going to do is say, I got three modes that matter. The V matrix tells me what they're doing in time. So I'm going to take the three dominant V columns. Those are my time dynamics. And I'm going to build a model on those. I'm going to run it through this sparse identification algorithm called Cindy. And what you're going to find when you do this is you actually find this normal form dynamics for the evolution of those three modes, dominant modes of the flow. And in fact, this was something that was derived by Bernd Nowak um, this was something that was kind of proposed back in around 71, where they were talking about this route towards turbulence, which involved a Hopf bifurcation. But it was a little bit of a mystery, because a Hopf bifurcation is cubic, whereas Navier-Stokes was quadratic. Right? So how does a quadratic produce this normal form bifurcation, which is cubic? So it turned out that after a lot of careful asymptotics, this is a 22, you know, this is a, this is pretty, 30, 32 year gap here, you, know, you finally get this derivation asymptotically correct that just says this is how this happens. There's a slow, fast dynamics that effectively produces the cubic out of this quadratic. And this was the normal form, and we got it just from one regression. Okay? So it does tell you something about the underlying nature. And this is a harder problem, right? So you're still taking a large scale problem, you're doing a reduction, but then discovering the dynamics in that reduced variable set. We did want to go up, though, to the full PDE setting instead of a proxy for the PDE. And so we started looking at something like this, back to the flow around the cylinder. And we started saying, let's go ahead and collect now the full state space of this thing. And now let's build, instead of our, I'm just going to change, modify my library to include terms that have spatial derivatives. I do the same regression. and I sample flow around a cylinder. You just give me those time series measurements. I produce for you Navier-Stokes. Okay. Now the problem with it in this form here, when I come through here, is that this is really high dimensional. So this optimization is big. However, we know there's low rank structure. And there's probably going to be low rank structure. I'm usually an advocate. There's always low rank structure somewhere in these systems that gets produced. You can massively subsample the data, build a much reduced version of this AX equals V problem, solve this. So this is all re related to compressive sensing and compressive measurements and so forth. And we can still construct Navier-Stokes. Yes. We have a lot of data in time. Yeah. Uh, we haven't had a problem with that. We, by the way, we don't have any proofs about like this 
convergence. We're, we're working on that in terms of this model discovery, but we have not had any problems with that. I mean, we can, you know, the, the main thing is if you can get clean derivatives, that's number one. And if you can measure, you have to measure, there's kind of in the some sense, for model selection in general, so if you're familiar with the model selection literature, there's, there's a proof for BIC as a criteria for convergence to model. One is low enough noise, long enough measurements, and that the actual model's in your library. And if you can get into the right space, you're guaranteed to converge. Now it turns out in practice, you're never where the theorem works. Same thing here. There's actually a theorem you can go to if I measure long enough, have enough data, and have the right library, this will work. So that is one PDE, and then we started playing around with, you know, here's sort of my, this kind of represents my graduate education right here in this slide. This is kind of the, the things I learned in graduate school from my particular graduate school, which is, you know, things, you know, KDV, Berger, Schrodinger, NLS, kurmoto shimashinsky reaction diffusion systems, Xavier <coughs> Stokes, and we get them all. And we tell you how we discretized. We tell you how much noise you can handle. And in some cases, you can handle very little noise. In some cases, you can handle more. The one that I think is interesting is this reaction diffusion system. We're, we're really intolerant to noise. And I actually have a conjecture of why that's true. Um, you see these spirals that we get out of this? If you talk to people sort of that do reaction diffusion systems, you say, hey, how many, uh, can you write down a model for me that produces spirals? I say, sure, I can write down a dozen models for you, right? It's not that hard to write down different models that all produce spiral waves. Trying to find this specific model, it's now selecting a bunch around a bunch of models that are very close to each other. So it has to, has to be, it's very intolerant to noise because there's a lot of models that will produce for you this re these spiral waves. Yes? We, we, I, I can tell you this, what we're working on that now. One thing that we have found that has, uh, one of our grad students, Kathleen, she was working on this and she came to us with this result that was really surprising, which is, you know, we'd been working on Lorenz, which was our first example to see if we could do anything. And we thought for sure, you know, we'd been running for a long time, so it hops back and forth between the, the two, uh, you know, when it's jumping in this pattern of the, the two attractors there. Uh, so it's hopping back and forth. We, had, we thought it had to see this for quite a while before it'd see that, oh, this is the Lorenz. And she found that if you sample at a high enough rate, you can go around one of these one and a half times and you get the lens out. It doesn't even have to see that it transitioned. So do I have an answer for you? No. But I know that if you sample at high enough rates with clean enough data, it's remarkable what you can do. And even if you haven't seen the scope of the entire range of the dynamics, it can still pick out these models. An important variation of this, which I think is actually relevant to many here, which is, yes, but Here's what's happening in my data. I'm taking measurements, and the whole system is shifting underneath me. This is certainly the case in neuroscience. In other words, there's some parametric dependencies. It's the same model, but there's some parameters making this thing drift. So for your ability to discover the governing equations is really compromised. So we started thinking about this, and here's, a, here's an example. Burgers with your advection term having a time dependency. So if you just try to do this straight up model discovery we do regression, especially for a long time series, you will fail. It's trying to find the equations, but one of the parameters is going all over the place, so it actually loads up your system with more, more terms, because it doesn't know how to handle that. So group sparsity, so or, or group lasso, glasso, um, was this idea of doing L1 regression, where what you do is you say, look, my parameters or my sparsity pattern is not changing, but I allow the parameters to change. So what we do is take bunches of data, smaller snapshots of time, and say, look, each snapshot of time, it's the same equation, but I allow the, the sparsity pattern has to be the same, but I allow the, the actual loadings or the parameters for those parameters for each of the terms to change. And so if you do this, here's the result. 
If you just do least squares, you get a or horrible thing. Group lasso is not, you get the wrong things often with group lasso. When we do this sequential group thresholding, and what we find is I actually get that advection term right on the money, same thing with the diffusion. So I can pull out this parametric dependency of the equation. So uh, the reason I wanted to show this is because I think this is actually really practical in practice. This is what you'd actually have to do if you're measuring a real system. Um, unless you're, you know, if you're measure, measuring things on geological time, maybe you don't have to worry about the parameter drifting on you. However, if you have long time series data where your system is actually changing slowly in time, same governing equations, it's just the parameters change, this is a great technique to go forward with. All right, here we go. This is my experiment. I'm super happy, proud of it. So first of all, I'd like to point out, for those of you from state schools, beautiful cinder block, off-white. Linoleum floor, off-white. Those are those walls that are like, you know, you could throw pens, pencils through. Anyway, all in off-white color. And what we did is we just drilled into the wall here. Oh, there we go. Come on. I got it. There. All right, here's my experiment. We put a pendulum on here. We swung this thing around. And here's just two snapshots of, uh, of the experiment. And what you can't quite see here is that on the end of this pendulum, we've actually stuck an Arduino chip. And that Arduino chip is just reading, you know, it's, it's pulling out the velocity or acceler it's an accelerometer. So we just pulled the data off of that for all these swings around the pendulum. Here are some of the trajectories. This is work with, so I talked my Karen into doing this. He's a physics undergrad. So he built the MacGyver experiment with that full rubber bands, okay, holding it together, pulling the data. And then what we did is, okay, does this work on real data? We just pulled this thing off. And in fact, you do this. Here's your Python notebook. I even left the like, you know, error, error, errors, whatever. I left it all there because I wanted to show you there. Here's what it actually came out with with the model. The x dot dt is equal to x1. The x1 dt is some small number x1 plus this sine x naught to pull out the damp pendulum for us. So we are really happy about this. In other words, it's actually, you know, you give this real data, it pulled out the pendulum equations. Remarkably, if you don't, so these pendulums, it's very important that you have some of the trajectories that go all the way around. If it doesn't go over the top and it's just a large oscillation, it will say, look, I, I'll just give you an x cubed. So it gives you back duffing. So what we've known is duffing is this approximation, right, for larger oscillations. It will try to always say duffing, and then as soon as it sees it go over the top, it says, I have to give you this. Okay? So, okay, that's our experiment. That's about as sophisticated as. So I only do ax equal to b, and that's my level of experiment. Don't judge. Okay. Here's where we want to go with it. Um, a lot of systems, but I, I you know. Here's a worm. This is called the C. elegans. Um, actually, right here at Rice, there's, I'm working with a guy, Jacob Robinson, who they can do whole brain imaging of this thing. This has only got 302 neurons. We know how they're connected. We still don't really know how this thing functions. If we have a shot at biology and understanding a creature all the way through, from, from A to B to Z all the way through, this is it. We know, how to, we know where its muscles are. We know how these neurons work. Um, so what we want to do is, it's interesting because the 302 neurons, when, you, when it's in a forward motion or backward motion, has very simple things. These things organize themselves into very structured, low dimensional patterns of activity. I will highlight two other things that are of practical importance. This one I've kind of become more excited about recently. I wasn't as, honestly, quite as excited until this last piece I want to show you. So this is going to be about Koopman theory and dynamic mode decomposition. So, Kuhn wrote this idea down in 31. He said, look, you give me a nonlinear dynamical system, finite dimensional, and I can define some function, put it in a functional space, some g of x, where in this infinite dimensional space, it's linear. Now, there's some problems with this, uh, but I do want to, so basically, it's like, it's this, this idea here. Nonlinear dynamical system defines some new coordinate system where it's linear. Okay, that's the mathematical statement. Um, 1931, he had no computer. 
So you're kind of limited about what you can do at that point, right? You're, maybe he would have gotten further if he had some computers to play around with. But it sits there for a long time until, you know, Igor Mezich around 2005 starts picking this back up. Um, and then you had the first algorithm to try to do this. If you assume g of x is equal to x, which is basically giving you a linear regression model to a dynamical system, that's what's called dynamic mode decomposition. Mezich, Rowley, Peter Schmidt, they kind of provided that viewpoint. But I want to say that you already know this concept. And I'm going to say that you already know this concept from the point of view of Berger's equation. You say, look, here is a nonlinear PDE. It's hard to solve because it's a nonlinear PDE. Generically, nonlinear PDEs, you don't have general methods that work across the board on everything. But if I transform it to this V variable, to the Kohlhoff, well, I actually know what I'm doing now. I get the heat equation. So one way to think about this is Kohlhoff is your Koopman operator. <coughs> now Kohlhoff is kind of famous. 1950-51, Kohl and Hoff independently found this transformation. And it is one of the few PDEs that we could do this with. Right? If we could do this with every PDE, our life would be a lot better and easier. We'd be able to actually solve a lot of problems we can't. So not only your Schrodinger, and I want to do it simply. I know I have the inverse scattering transform, but really what I want to do is just say, well, I could work with my original variable, or I could work, so, so here it is, I could start thinking about doing, I told you the dynamic mode decomposition is an algorithm that tries to compute this linear evolution. So I could say, what if my observable was a state space? Okay, fine. So here, if I do that in this dynamic mode decomposition algorithm, I do not such a bad reconstruction. I could also choose this as my variable set, x mod x squared x. Why do I pick that? Because, well, I, I see that's my nonlinearity, so I just pick it as part of my observable. I do a great job. And if I pick the wrong observables, I do a horrible job in reconstructing this. So your observable selection is very important. I want this, not that. And then what's the difference between these two? Well, it turns out when I look at the difference carefully, all the items should be on the imaginary axis, and in fact, they almost are. And in fact, this, the error between the true solution and this observable is almost down at numerical round off. What I mean by numerical round off here is that I was using an OD4-5 stepper, so my error is around 10 to minus 6, so I'm almost <laughs> as accurate as I can be. If I use this linear set here, it's, uh, it's up here, and then of course I use this one here and I get big errors. Obviously, there's ways to pick maybe good variables from knowledge, but there's also this idea of, and I've been sort of, if I can be frank, um, so let me be very frank. Uh, neural nets. Everybody's talking about neural nets, deep neural nets, deep learning. It's everywhere. I live in Seattle. That's all we talk about, that and coffee. So I'm going to use this variational autoencoder type scenario, which is I'm going to start out with my input space. I'm going to go through a neural net to find me this Koopman embedding. And, but the main thing I want to highlight here, and this is work with Bessany Lush, who's one of our postdocs, is I know that it's low rank on the back end. So for instance, your pendulum. What you know is it's, it's two degrees of freedom. But when you get really big oscillations, right, your asymptotic expansion starts adding a lot of terms. It looks a lot higher dimensional. But really, it's still two degrees of freedom. So I'm going to keep this at two degrees of freedom, for instance. I'm going to keep this here at the intrinsic rank of my dynamics. So I want to train a method that gets me over here. And then I can come back out. And in the, here, in this regime here, this thing, I want to enforce that it's linear dynamics. Okay. And by the way, there's a lot of people working in this area. I'm going to point to uh, 2017, 17, 17, 17, 17. They're all like within the last six months. Deep neural nets for doing prediction. Now, they don't do this pinch down. They just simply scale it up into a big deep neural net, and it works awesome. So the way I think about it here, we're going to train a neural net so that when I go from y of k to y k of plus 1 in this new space, it's linear, like Koopman wants to be. And so I'm going to enforce that. I'm also going to enforce that, you know, Going from to y of k plus 1, you can either go this route or this route. So I basically train the neural net under these constraints. And let me show you what it does. Um, and there's one, other, sorry, there's one other thing that I want to point out here. And this is actually, we, 
we actually struggled this for quite, quite a long time. For six months, we just went nowhere. And the reason we went nowhere, it actually came back to something so simple. What happens to a pendulum when you start swinging it bigger? There's a couple things that happen. The number one thing that happens is the frequency shifts. And I knew that since grad school, right? You did poincare Linstead, multiple scales. You found like, OK, so the frequency is changing. And you can get an asymptotic correction to that change, like if you do an asymptotic expansion around duffing. So frequency changes. It also produces harmonics. So we said, let's let it parametrize this linear term by a frequency. In other words, the frequency is a parametrization of the dynamics. If you don't explicitly account for that, what you're actually having to do here is build a massive network to account for the infinite expansion you're going to have to do, Taylor series expansion, which accounts for the frequency shifts here. You account for it, and then you can preserve the two-dimensional structure there. So here it is. Here's the pendulum. I come back to the pendulum, and obviously, OK, it's a little low-level problem, but we haven't been able to solve the problem. Pendulum. A lot of people think we've solved the pendulum. We haven't solved the pendulum. We've done it when it's linear or maybe a little bit of cubic term. We had that's it. So it's funny. We look past this problem that we think we've solved. We haven't solved it. And what we've been able to do with this is say, look, this is. A, we're going to go ahead and take this full thing, start doing swings that are quite big, up all the way out to this separatrix structure, up to the saddle up top. And so here's the nonlinear dynamics of this thing as you get bigger and bigger swings. And what we can do with this trick of learning the embedding is finding that these are your two eigenfunctions for that system that's parametrized by an omega. And in this new system, this whole thing becomes linear all the way out to the swing coming to the top. So I've linearized the entire thing just by simply accounting for this k omega. Now, uh, granted, it's a simple problem, but I'm super happy with solving a simple problem because it's, it's a hard problem. Simple problems don't mean they're not hard. This is a really hard problem. And I think this gives us a way forward. And this also changed my mind about what we can do with neural nets, because we would have not gotten these by hand or some other way. We got these from the deep neural net, learning the embedding. All right, so the idea here, on a broader sense, is that you would say the problem with Koopman, too, by the way, is when you turn it into a linear system, is there's only one fixed point available to you, right? So if you have a nonlinear system with three or four fixed points, once you go to a Koopman embedding, there's only it's an infinite dimensional linear system. There's only one fixed point. What happened to the others? They went away to infinity. Okay, so what you really need for as many fixed points that you might have in your system is you need that many Koopman embeddings. So each one has a linearization. I live in some nonlinear space. I have a, some place here where the dynamics occurs, like some fixed point, maybe one over here. And it's fully nonlinear. So what I want to do is I might be able to do dy dynamic mode decomposition to get some linear approximation. Koopman allows me to flatten this entire region out into a linear space where all I got to do, if I want to march forward in futures, multiply by k, constant matrix. If I want to go 10 steps into the future, k to the 10th. That easy. Okay? And over here, I get another Koopman embedding. And we're still working on how to figure out how the transitions happen, which is maybe you get over to this edge. You're going to eventually go over that little spot there. So then you're going to switch from this Koopman embedding to this Koopman embedding. So there's, there are ways we've thought about doing that, but I think we can do that. Final thoughts, and I won't spend too much time here, is uh, there's a big problem in what I've told you. Uh, it says I've got, you know, look, we've been building these models. I have full state measurements of everything. And that's just not the truth. So you're going to have measurements in fixed locations often. And so here's, here's the moral of the story from my point of view, or the, the dogma that underlies my whole thinking here is I don't care what system you're looking at, there's probably low rank structure in it. Patterns of activity that you're trying to get after, and it's, it's not massively high dimensional. Most things are low dimensional. So you can start using these ideas of randomized linear algebra to massively subsample and still be able to reconstruct these structures. Okay, So that's one idea. Uh, and I think we need more randomized, you know, in general, I think we need more linear algebra in our lives. And I'm convinced of that. And it needs to be taught differently because I never picked up on the fact that it was harder than squares, right? This is all we teach. 
So all of you who teach linear algebra, we keep, the books are still talking about square matrices. These don't exist. They're like unicorns. Okay? We talk about them in class. But they're either this or this. I mean, our students are completely unequipped to handle that change. It blows their minds. And the question is, how do we then start placing sensors? And so the way we're going to start placing sensors is starting using some ideas. This is work with Krithika Manohar, where she's actually finishing up. She's going to go work with Andrew Stewart here. So it's so exciting um, next year. Uh, so we were looking at optimal sensor placement. And what we wanted to do is start thinking about, well, where would you place sensors? And especially under the fact that a lot of the dynamics we're going to measure are multi-scale. So we started doing is thinking about, let's do these decompositions like a dynamic mode decomposition and start doing multi-scale decompositions because there's large-scale structures, small-scale structures. Take those into account so that the modes that come out of this structure allow us to think about where we should place sensors. I would like to place sensors where the dynamics is actually happening. So my ability to potentially reconstruct goes up. So we can do this and start training on libraries of modes that are actually exhibited in the dynamics. And then we can sort of build a library of this. And then we can do a sparse regression to determine which library element we want to actually bring in on any measurement. Now, how would you get this library of like full state measurements? So the way I think about it in practice is, for instance, you wanted to measure something in the ocean. You're obviously not going to be able to build a library of ocean stuff because that means still full state. But you could take your simulation engine, which is a proxy for it, build the modes out of there, and then use it on the real physical system. Start doing, again, more L1 magic, um, subject to a measurement matrix, your modes, and your expansion in this modal <coughs> set. And one way to think about placing sensors is just doing QR pivot locations. Works amazingly well. I'm going to skip forward because I'm out of, almost out of time. But let me just show you this movie here. What you're going to see on this movie are sensor locations. And the sensors you see there are able to reconstruct the entire dynamics of the ocean. Okay, from this training routine. Okay, come on. So look how many are the ones. This is over a 20-year period. You can just watch where these sensors are. At most, you need like four or five sensors going at, at one time, and you can reconstruct the entire thing. Okay? So this is getting towards the power of what you can do with limited sensors, right? And by informed locations. Okay? So when she, sh when she started showing this movie, I was so impressed. I was like, wow, I'm a, I, it's amazing. Like, you're telling me it, it, it totally works. This is, this is how you would do this to place sensors. And in fact, if I take a histogram of all the locations, here's the, where they are over a 20-year cycle. So you can see that this histogram tells you that, like, you know, I can basically take 50 measurement locations across the world, and I can reconstruct everything. By the way, notice it seems that the, the Caspian Sea here has its own little dynamics, right? It's, it's like you need measurements because it's sort of untied to the global modes elsewhere. Sorry, sorry, here. Yes, where am I? I, have, I was all of a sudden white and black. OK, here we go. It's oh, right here. Or you need a bunch here. And these, these are like its own local climates. Final thing, if I also penalize with respect to cost, so there's this issue too. It's like there's places I can't put sensors. Then you can start doing things like this. If I have 200 sensors, the best locations are here. Now I start raising the cost on these. Notice what happens. And the cost meaning it's expensive to put them in the ocean. They start moving off the ocean. Eventually, they're all on land. The question is, this was my optimal positions. These are now my cost-constrained optimal. What's the difference in performance? About 1%. So that's a huge thing. So I've lost 1% error, I got, or gained 1% error, uh, but I moved all of my sensors away from having to put them on ocean. I put them on land. And so now I have a way, a principled way to do this uh, technique to, to get myself a way to think about where I should be measuring. Mostly what I tried to hopefully present was sort of these principal techniques for determining dynamics, how to maybe even create a better variable set for you. you. You measured this, but you should really think about the dynamics in this new variable set, and then also optimize sensor locations. Um, and I think it becomes important because you see this data pipe that's coming our way. This thing just gets bigger and bigger. That's what that's supposed to represent. This is, this is getting so big that if you're not processing that data 
on the fly, I think we're going to head into a real problem because you're just going to sit on terabytes of data and you're not going to know what to do with it. So we need, and, and by the way, not all data is worthwhile, right? That's, most of it's not. So that's the other thing we have to like get around, which is, yeah, big data is better, but actually a lot of that big data is just worthless. But you better figure out what's, right, so you need an algorithm to say, okay, this is worthwhile, these are worthless, let's keep the worthwhile 